Well, good morning, ladies, for joining us for today's webinar, Enterprise Architecture with Visio Excel and PowerPoint, the recipe for zero business value. We'll be joined today by Mark Langhorse, who many of you will know, who will be providing this presentation. Just a couple of housekeeping notes first. Firstly, we will be taking questions throughout the, the webinar, so please submit your questions via the question panel on the GoToWebinar control panel. Secondly, we will be recording today's webinar, and everyone who attends or didn't manage to attend will be receiving a link to the recording. And also on that, li on that link, we'll be providing access to these slides and associated white papers as well. So once again, please make sure you submit your questions via the questions panel. And with that, it's my pleasure to hand over to Mark Langhorse. Mark, over to you. Thank you, Will. Um, yes, the presentation of today is about enterprise architecture with uh, office tools and why that doesn't really cut it. So um, yeah, let's let's start with a little bit of introduction uh, for those of you who don't know me or biz design. Um, first, uh, a, a few notes about who I am. I work with BizDesign as a managing consultant and chief technology evangelist. Um, some of you might know my name from the Archimate modeling language, which is uh, an open group standard nowadays, and I've managed the development of that um, ever since it was just a research project in the Netherlands. If you're really interested in Archimate, by the way, next week the new version of the language, version 3.1, will come out. Uh, so uh, stay tuned for that. But this presentation is not really about Archimate. You might see a few Archimate things, but it's really uh, about other subjects. Um, if you want to reach out to me, feel free to drop me an email. Uh, you can find my email address in here. And about BizDesign, we are a software company that provides uh, software for uh, helping organizations design and realize business change. Uh, of course, architecture is an important part of that. It's not limited to that, but that is certainly uh, one of the core elements of our proposition. Uh, and just last week, the new Magic Quadrant uh, came out that Gartner publishes on uh, enterprise architecture, and we are very happy to be a leader again, as you can see, uh, right up there at the top of the leaderboard. That's, that's us. Um, if you want to download for this, you can find that on our website as well. Um, well, enough PR. Let's go into the story itself. Why is enterprise architecture with office tools such a bad idea? Well, you see this happen quite often. That organizations think, well, let's let's just start simple. Let's just start with office tools. Uh, and in, in particular, I often see PowerPoint, Excel, and Visio. These three are the most common ones. Word, of course, as well. But it's really uh, something that you see fairly often. And it's often just management that tells their architecture team, yeah, 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 uh, we're not going to buy you any tools yet. Just show us value first. Sounds like a good idea, right? Well, no, not really. Because, as I will argue uh, over the course of this presentation, uh, our job is really something that you cannot do, even at a small scale, with just office tools. And I will give you the arguments that you could use if you're an architect to convince your management why they should invest in proper tools and not just let you do the job with, uh, say, uh, PowerPoint. So let's start with the first, the first aspect of this. It's about collaboration. Um, if you just look at any real life size organization, you have to connect the dots, and there are many of these dots, uh, tens to hundreds of thousands of elements in any business IT or IT landscape of any life size organization. So that also means that you have to manage all these connections and that it's not some, some single user just editing a single document, doing stuff in one PowerPoint, uh, one Word document, uh, one spreadsheet. It's not like that. You need to work together with lots of people on all this content. And even, even just working with office tools, all of you know that it's quite difficult to do that. Working together with a larger group of people on just an office document, you have to deal with versioning, uh, changes that conflict, tracking all your updates, uh, distributing the content to various stakeholder groups, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Just a, a simple scenario would be something like this. We have, um, say, a list of applications that you get from IT service management about your current state applications, right? You put that in a spreadsheet. Then somebody else copies that list in, and makes a Visio picture out of that to show how things are connected. So you have an overview of your application landscape based on this spreadsheet. You have some boxes and lines. 
Then maybe a third person uh, likes that picture, puts it in a PowerPoint, uh, but changes it to make it look nicer for, for their stakeholders that uh, are going to look at that PowerPoint. So the picture changes and the picture is based on that spreadsheet. So we can already see where this is going. And then one of these stakeholders looking at that PowerPoint sees interesting stuff there, uh, but wants to highlight some specific information. Maybe say some risk associated with some application, um, thinking about the business impact of using outdated technology, for example, highlighting that in your, uh, in your picture from the PowerPoint, putting that in a Word document. And now, suppose you add a new application. What's going to happen? Well, you can imagine you have to update all these documents. There's no way to check any kind of consistency. It's all manual work. And this is just for a very simple scenario of a bunch of applications spread out across these different office documents. You can already see that this doesn't really work. So collaboration across office, office tools on architecture is not something you easily do. And this is a very basic scenario, right? But let's, let's go a bit deeper than this, because there's a bigger problem uh, here. It's not just about pictures. Architecture is not about drawings, about just diagrams. It's about the meaning behind these diagrams. Uh, and Geek and Poke on the right-hand right side here have sort of the worst case scenario um, where the picture doesn't mean anything. But I see often in, in practice that you have to ask the architect what their pictures mean. If you just put a PowerPoint up, what are these boxes and lines? What do they represent? So that's uh, a big issue. The relationships have to be managed, have to be uh, sort of formalized. Otherwise, yeah, just drawing a line between two boxes, what does that line mean? Uh, is there inf information flowing? Is it another kind of dependency? What's, what are you actually modeling? And how are you keeping these pictures consistent? Because if you spread them out across a series of PowerPoints, maybe showing the evolution of your landscape or whatever, um, how do you how do you know that this next slide represents the the next iteration of that evolution and the, the boxes in there relate in some way to the boxes in the previous slide? You just don't know. Uh, what's also important is that a picture is just a picture. It's shown in one way, and if you have different stakeholders needing the information in different formats, say some stakeholders like tables because they're from finance, other stakeholders want to have these uh, these boxes and lines because they have a technical background yet other stakeholders want to have something uh, a bit more informal, cartoon-like. If you just have a picture, you can't change that. So that's also an issue. And finally, you can't analyze a picture. You can just look at it. That's basically all. You can't just uh, crunch the numbers. You can't follow the relationships, etc. And we'll go into that more deeply later on in the presentation. So what we need is models. And models are more than just pictures. Visio, for example, is a drawing tool. It's not a modeling tool. It just creates pictures. A true model is something with a structure that's formalized uh, and that lets you do all kinds of other things. PowerPoint, by the way, is even worse than Visio. Uh, as you can imagine, Visio at least has some structure to it. PowerPoint is really just, just images. Now, a model is something with a well-defined structure. A model is more than just uh, the picture you see. The picture is just a visualization of that model. And you could have multiple visualizations, but it's really about the structure behind that. And in that sense, it's like language. Uh, the grammar of your language tells you whether a sentence is, uh, is allowed, is correct. You can't just put words in, in just any order. It, there is some structure to it. And models are the same. That's also why Archimate is a modeling language. It's like natural language. It's about structure. Um, and the model has well-defined semantics. The boxes and lines represent something. They mean something. Uh, so you know what, uh, what to do with them and how you can, for example, analyze them. Because every box and every line has a well-defined meaning. It's not just a picture. It has, it has a re relationship with reality behind it. And then finally, um, unlike just a picture, which is its own visualization, you can show the contents of your model in various ways. You can have lists of elements. You can have matrices showing cross-reference tables. You can have pictures. You can have all kinds of ways of this displaying the same information to different stakeholders that have different needs. Not everybody can read the same diagrams. Now, you might be familiar with, with modeling languages like Archimate or UML, which have their own specific notation. But in the case of Archimate, the standard itself already says that you should create specific viewpoints for specific stakeholders and not just rely on the standard notation that's there to support the architects. 
But of course, there are so many different stakeholders, no standard can capture all the different kinds of visualizations that you could envisage. But good tools should support, should support you with that. Um, and just creating pictures in Visio or PowerPoint never lets you change that visualization for other stakeholders. So the advantage of models is that they create this transparency. They, they help you communicate clearly and unambiguously because everything has a meaning, has a semantics. They also facilitate alignment between the different bits of your, of your landscape, uh, from your high level goals down to your change initiatives and everything in between. And we'll discuss that in a bit more detail later uh, as well. Uh, and models help you make better decisions. You can do all kinds of analyses and calculations based on your models. So you can use them for, say, risk analyses or uh, allocate budgets based on them, et cetera, et cetera. And we'll see a bit more about analysis later as well. And now you can have different kinds of models at all kinds of uh, abstraction levels, for example, very high level visionary models that just give them a rough idea of where you want to go down to detailed specifications of something you're building or executable models in, say, VPMN, uh, things you feed into your process execution engines or uh, whatever infrastructure you have for that. All these models can also be interconnected. If you have the right tools for that, you can create a line of sight from this high level strategic vision down to the implementation and back up again so that you can, for example, prioritize your investments in change initiatives based on the contribution of such an initiative to something in the core of your architecture, which in turn results in certain business outcomes that you want to have so that you can see, well, this say project is more important than that one because it contributes to more of my business goals. So that's quite important. Just to give you an example of how you can connect these models from high level to more detailed, um, all created by the way in our tool and all based on an underlying argument model, but it's often shown in different ways. Here we have an example from uh, the world of energy production and consumption. And we see different parties involved. We see, for example, energy producers, we see energy traders and providers, we see the grid operators for the, the backbone and the distribution grid, and we have different kinds of customers. Now, this is the current situation in many cases, but we already see a shift in this. We see that more and more organizations and, and, and private customers put solar panels on their, on their roofs and are um, basically uh, uh, creating their own energy sources and then maybe selling that energy to other customers. That leaves room for another player in this ecosystem, a peer-to-peer -peer platform provider. Now, once this starts happening, we see that the money flows that are displayed here are changing. If you look closely, you, you saw that some of these money bags were changing size. And if we move further, we see more changes there. And maybe in the future, more chain, more, more uh, money will flow through these peer-to-peer -peer providers. And the backbone grid operators and energy producers they might be uh, kind of left out in the cold. So this is a major evolution in the ecosystem of an energy provider. Now, if we take such a provider and we've called it Archi Power, like we have the, uh, the Archi Assurance and Archi Metal and all these other Archi cases, we have our fictitious but realistic um, energy company, Archi Power, and they've made a SWOT analysis. And here we see various aspects of that uh, I don't want to go into the details here, but this is actually modeled in, in Archimedes assessment concept. But we see, for example, that they have um, uh, well the advantage of scale and the global presence. Uh, they're leading in their millennials customer segment, which will be uh, something we will focus on in, in uh, other parts of the story. But they also see some threats. Uh, for example, the, the customer loyalty is a problem. People just easily switch. These disruptive new entrants, like this peer-to-peer -peer provider that I mentioned, all kinds of other areas that they, they've analyzed. Now, looking at the company um, from the from the well, the, the typical balance scorecard perspective, the four aspects of that that you see quite often, we have this financial, customer, internal process, and learning and growth perspective on the company. We see that they have uh, set themselves a number of different goals. They want to grow their revenue, for example. Um, they want to have, um, say, uh, long-term contracts, and they see this customer-generated energy as something that's that's coming up. Um, they want to improve their internal processes and reduce the obsolete applications, for example. Uh, and in the learning and growth uh, part, they, they want to work with agile development. So various different aspects of where they want to go. And you can zoom in on that. And here we see for the, the customer part of this balance scorecard that they have set a number of goals, ways of measuring that, target values, current outcomes, and then initiatives maybe to bridge the gap between the target and the outcome. 
So if the revenue growth should be 10% year over year and it's lower than that, then they have this initiative called Customer 2020. Um, so all sorts of ways of doing that. We can dep depict that in more detail in, a, in a, a true Archimate model. You could say this is shown in the Archimate notation. And here we see, for example, again, that Customer 2020 um, course of action, that initiative, contributing to some goals, which in turn are related to this customer satisfaction driver, uh, which well, has the CEO as a stakeholder. We see a number of technologies that they, they are thinking of. Um, maybe they want to introduce some, some new things there, like this transactive energy that they, uh, well, I'm not an expert in energy, but that's what they, what they are doing. Um, and then they also do a scenario analysis of what, what, what might be possible business options. So there's always a baseline scenario of doing nothing. Um, then they are looking at this millennial segment where they want to have customer empowerment because th this is a segment that uh, is really interested in, uh, in uh, well, energy as, as, a, as a subject, um, clean energy, energy savings, et cetera. Uh, and they, they look at the impact of that scenario on different areas, like for example, the partners. And here we have this peer-to-peer -peer energy trading partner again. Uh, but also resources and technology and customers. And then we, we see this assessment of different aspects of such a, such a scenario in, in cost, risk, and strategic value. And we see some more calculations on the right about the cost of the scenario for the company itself, um, some overview graphs, um, some future predictions of how, where this might go uh, in terms of ROI. So you see that initially the sustainable energy for all requires a huge investment. So we see a big dip here and eventually it will come up. And then this customer empowerment for millennials is a bit above that, but the baseline where you do nothing just sees the value gradually go down. Again, an analysis you can base partially on your models. Say a, a, a cost calculation can be based on your, your architecture models and other models, ecosystem models, for example. This is the kind of picture that might be interesting for management to decide on what, what scenario do we want to uh, do we want to proceed with? Then you can look at your business model canvas. If we want to go with this middle scenario about millennials, then we might want to have specific value propositions for, for them, uh, which require certain relationships with customers, certain channels, specific resources and activities and partners, etc. So a business model canvas. Again, this is expressed in Archimed concepts, but you don't see that in here. Um, zooming in a bit more, we can define how that value is then produced. Here we see the overall value stream of the company from planning the capacity to generating energy and distributing and selling it to service, uh, to serve and serving the customers. We see different goals and outcomes, value propositions for each stage and the capabilities needed to support these, these stages. This thing is called a business outcome journey map that Gartner has invented this term, uh, typical for Gartner to have uh, lots of words in a single, uh, single notion. Um, so here you see this, this um, basically, it's uh, the cross-reference between your value streams, uh, the, the stages of your value stream, and the capabilities needed for that. So just a cross-mapping between them, and then some extra information. Uh, again, a high-level picture of what the, the company does. Not as high-level as what we've seen before. It becomes more concrete now. Um, again, not shown in, in a technical way, um, but still based on an underlying architecture model. And we can use the same idea of, of the journey maps. And actually, th that's where this business outcome journey comes from, from a customer journey. And here we see the customer journey uh, for someone, someone who wants to have solar panels uh, um, uh, on their roof or installing a solar farm in this case. And you see the different channels you go through, uh, the experience in these channels, maybe the feeling of the customer based on some customer survey. Data from that survey is then linked to your architecture model. So you can see where you need to improve. For example, in the first stage where this is a really frowny phase, that's not really, uh, say the website might not be very helpful. This is again, all based on one underlying model. Now we get to a more architectural kind of model here. We see specifically for a value stream on, on this solar farming, we see some internal processes. We see the application supporting that, technology services, and we could drill down even further to the details of the implementation. So here you see how these models work together. And this is all based on one underlying model. We can, we can model the transition from current state to future state, uh, the, the capabilities we need to improve, the application services supporting that technology, different uh, programs and, and projects to roll that out, KPIs to measure it, et cetera, uh, all connected. A single model showing how all this works together. So this gives you this 
integrated line of sight from your high level business goals and visionary ideas via the strategies, the capabilities, the value streams, uh, the internal operations down to the change initiatives that make all this happen. Now, if you, if you wouldn't have this connection, how would, you, how would you know what's valuable to the company, which initiatives to invest in, how to decide on those, where to prioritize, what, what the risks are, et cetera. So this notion of having models that connect everything, that's really quite essential to provide business value as an architect. If you don't have this interconnection, what, what are you doing? You're just showing a bunch of PowerPoints. How, is, how, how could you decide based on that? Now that's the, the modeling side of the story. But based on these models, you can do much more than that. Um, you can create analyses. And the value of architecture is really in the conclusions you can draw from them. So decision-making based on your architectures, that's really what you offer to the company. The architecture itself is only as valuable as the quality and the value of the decisions based on that architecture. Architecture itself is not a goal. Better decision-making, uh, for example, on investments, on risk reduction, on compliance, et cetera, et cetera. That's really what it's about. And you can think of all kinds of analyses. And I will just show a few examples of what you could do if you have this uh, lined up. Uh, and that ranges really from analyzing the, say, the threat to your business continuity of outdated technology down to uh, risk and security in, in the cyber uh, world uh, and all kinds of things in between. So let me just show you a few examples of that. Um, so first of all, let's let's look at other ways of, uh, uh, of analyzing this. Some people would say, ah, but I've got Excel for that. And you, you do have these Excel wizards that can really work with pivot tables and do all kinds of magic with them. But there's a big difference between what you can put in Excel and how your architecture structures structured. An architecture is really about connecting different types of elements with relationships. And Excel is not really good at this kind of structure because it's a graph. Uh, and Excel is good at tables, which have a regular structure. And a graph is much more free format. You can have all kinds of interconnections there. And building analyses of graphs is not something you can do in Excel. It just doesn't work that way. It's a different type of data structure. It's not well suited for that. Um, so you do need to have this kind of graph structure to support your analyses. Spreadsheets will work for some calculations, but only a very limited set of things, maybe some cost calculations, but that's about it. So let me show you some examples. Here we have a business continuity analysis. And what we do here is um, based on everything supporting your business capabilities, and this is part of a capability map, we calculate the, in this case, uh, availability of that capability based on the availability of the underlying bits of your architecture. For example, the availability of the applications supporting this, these capabilities. Uh, and as you can imagine, if you have a high availability of your uh, applications, but you need lots and lots of them, the overall availability of your capabilities might be a lot lower. Um, just uh, to do the math, if you have a 99% availability of all your applications, if you need 30 of them for a specific business capability, then 99% to the power of 30, that's about 75%. So one in four uh, uh, times you'll, you'll have a failure. That's really not what you want. And you can do similar kinds of things with, say, um, technology obsolescence. I've built that recently for, for a customer of ours, where you can, based on the, the end of life date you get from, from vendors, from sources like Technopedia, you can calculate what the risks are for the business capabilities that rely on that technology via all kinds of stuff in between, say your business processes, your, your services in between that technology layer and your capabilities. You can assess the risk of outdated technology, say running something on Windows XP or whatever, uh, the risk for your business capability. So business continuity is something you can analyze based on this. And this for many organizations, continuity is really crucial. Take this energy company, well, business continuity is probably their, their key thing. Continuity of energy delivery is really uh, important. Um, now, suppose we, based on an analysis like this, um, we drill down into the application landscape and we find that there are some issues there. Here we see a, a classical application lifecycle analysis picture with the four quadrants of tolerate, invest, 
migrate and eliminate. That's why it's often called a time analysis. Uh, and we might want to focus on those applications that have high costs and high risk associated with them. Could be the risk of obsolescence, could also be other kinds of risks, maybe that the quality is just not good enough, uh, or you have skill risk that nobody knows about them anymore. And um, that's, I'll, I'll leave that for now, but you, you get the idea. Now here we see with these colors, we see a life cycle advice for these applications. And typically the, the ones in the eliminate quadrant, that's where you really want to focus. And certainly when they're costly and risky, so those are the applications you might want to uh, get rid of as soon as possible. Now, if we use this color coding in our application landscape, we get a picture like this. Um, well, let's zoom in on this a bit more. Um, this is sort of a hybrid ArcuMet picture where we see, uh, on the one hand, ArcuMet notation for these boxes, but we don't see all the relationships because it's put in a matrix. So uh, we see on the left hand, we see capabilities. At the top, we see some data domains, and then we see the application supporting that. Uh, by the way, the names of these applications are fake uh, because that was from an anonymized example from a customer. So don't look too much at that. But you get the idea. You see the, the advice of um, the previous analysis plotted in our, uh, your application landscape. So you can immediately see which parts of your capabilities uh, are affected by this risk of outdated technology or by the need to replace an application. So you can see the impact of change from this overview picture right away. And you can look at that in more detail. If these applications need each other, um, you also need to take care uh, when replacing them that their life cycles are managed in the right way. Uh, for example, here at the bottom, we see this application called Crystal Ball. Uh, and we see that it goes end of life around uh, well, Q1 2018. So that was, this was a picture from last year uh, because it, it's in operation until then. And then it goes into maintenance and retirement. And there's another application called Ramadera that goes end of life somewhere in Q4 2017. And we see this red bar here, and that red bar actually means that there's a conflict between the life cycles of these two. And if I would drill down into the architecture, I would see that Crystal Ball uses Ramadera for some purpose. So if we switch this one off, Crystal Ball has a problem. So here we see the more detailed planning. If we go back to the previous analysis, we might decide, oh, we need to switch off this application, replace it by something. And then we see over here that there's more to it than that, that there are some dependencies that we need to take care of. Again, something you will never be able to do with something in, in PowerPoint or Visio. You can't see these analyses. You can't do the calculations there. And this is an even more advanced example and using risk and security analysis. Here we see um, a cyber, uh, cyber attack. And we see the cyber criminal uh, attempting a man in the middle attack because there is a weak encryption of payment data problem and an insecure transmission channel problem. These are vulnerabilities. Uh, of the data transmission and the, uh, the encryption here. And we see on the right-hand side how this might be shown to management uh, using a heat map where we have the threat capability versus the control strength. And we see that the control strength is not up to par compared to the threat capability. So if we now introduce some uh, improved control strengths, we see that these traffic lights go to green or yellow instead of red. We see that the uh, threat capability remains the same. You can't make the hacker any, any dumber, but you can improve your control strength. So we see things move to the right in this picture. And this is an even more advanced kind of analysis. This is also based on Archimate. And if you're really interested in this, there's also, um, this is the combination of Archimate and the, the open fair standard from the open group. And there's a whole white paper behind this, how this analysis works. So if you want to know more about that, just drop me an email. A colleague of mine was really one of the, uh, the experts on this. Uh, but this shows you how deep you could go with your models. No way you could do any of this using just PowerPoint, Visio, uh, and Excel. Then there's a third issue, and that's about scaling things. You can't scale up from your Office documents. How would you, how would you maintain your consistency if you have many different documents just, um, just to cover all the, all the aspects of your architecture? Like I said before, you have hundreds of thousands of objects sometimes in, in a larger organization. How would you cover that with your Office documents? Um, how would you integrate with external data sources? If you have a CMDB from which you can pull all kinds of information on, their, on your current landscape, how would you do that with Office? No chance. How would you automate things, uh, automatic updates, whatever? It's just not possible, um, let alone profiting from, from uh, existing information that's often put in some reference model using a model, of course, uh, that you can easily read in a, in, a, in a proper tool, but you can do nothing with it in, in 
in your office tools. And so scaling up from office is just not an option. So that makes the office road a dead, dead end street. And if your management says, like I said at the beginning, oh, you should just start working with office and then later on we'll, we'll buy you a real tool. If you do that, you'll end up with lots of office documents that are just not, uh, not manageable anymore. And you can't get out of that, uh, out of that without a huge effort to redo all that work. And then there's another problem, that's a lack of, of guidance and quality control. In Office, you can do anything you want. You can draw any picture you want. There's no way of enforcing any kind of uh, conventions or standards or your own ways of working. There's no quality control at all. Anyone can draw any picture. Sometimes that's useful if it's just for informal communication. But if you want to have a true architecture, this is just not good enough. Uh, and another problem is the, the organization of the content. Most of you will have the experience that if you put something on, say, your shared drive or in a SharePoint site, it quickly becomes a horrible mess. I've seen some examples of trying to use SharePoint for managing the architecture. Well, I wouldn't recommend it. SharePoint is just not suited for that. It, it doesn't work. And there's also no, no real governance. And you can put all these documents in there. You can just do anything you want. Uh, but there's no true structure behind that uh, that lets you manage your architecture as a model with good access control, good governance around it, with things like workflow. It just doesn't work. Office doesn't let you do that. And then finally, and that's maybe the worst of all, if your management tells you that you should just use Office, what does that tell you? What, what kind of commitment is that? If professionals have to work with primitive tools because their management doesn't want to provide them with the real stuff. Uh, take these other examples here. Your sales department, are they managing their, their leads using, uh, using Word? I think not. Finance, what, what are they using? Well, of course, they will use Excel quite a lot, but certainly they will have a, a true financial system as well, uh, and, and not just some, some, some calculator. Uh, your, your software developers, are they just using Notepad? I guess not. So why would you be forced to use some primitive tools? It's not, it's not how things should work. So you do need the best people with the best tools available if you are embarking on any kind of major transformation in your organization. You just don't want to, to, to run the risk uh, of failure because you forgot to give the people the right means. And it's not about cost, actually. If you just look at the savings you make uh, from using a, a, a good tool set, uh, even just in the, the effort spent by architects in maintaining all these inconsistent documents in, uh, in Office, even that effort, taking that effort away, not, not talking even about the quality of the outputs of the architect, but just the effort, even that is already more than enough to, uh, to make the business case for investing in a good tool. So in conclusion, um, solid tools are really important. Uh, any professional discipline needs good tools. You can't, you can't do without, it's important. And to really deliver business value, you need, first of all, this support for collaboration with many others. Architecture is not a single user profession. Certainly in larger organizations, lots and lots of people are involved and you have to coordinate that. What you also need to really deliver value is this line of sight from all these change initiatives via what they create and change to the outcomes they produce. If you don't have that, how would you decide on, on these initiatives? How would you decide which projects to fund and which not? If you don't have any idea what they're going to create and how things are connected, if you don't have any feedback loop back from the, the outcomes to these initiatives, you won't learn anything at all either. So it's really important to close this, uh, close this loop and have this connected. You also need the analyses to support decision making. It's not just looking at pretty pictures and then uh, some manager says, hmm, yeah, I like that picture, let's invest in that. that. That's not how things work. You need to have a solid underpinning of your decision making. And you need solutions that scale up to the size of your enterprise. You can't, you can't just work with a few office documents and think that that will scale to, to any reasonable size if you have an organization of more than a few people and systems. It just doesn't work that way. You also need guidance to ensure that the quality of the products that the architects produce is good enough. It's not just a matter of drawing nice pictures and then hoping for the best. You want to maybe uh, have some standards that people uh, need to here too and you could do that at different levels you can you can really enforce standards and then it might become a bit too rigid you can coach people in that you can 
highlight areas where it needs to be improved and good tools can help you with all these kinds of uh, quality controls. So that's also quite, quite useful and relevant. And finally, of course, you need commitment from your organization. That was my previous slide. If you don't have that, I would be seriously worried as an architect when I would work in an organization that wouldn't give me the right tools. Would you still be in a job one or two years from now if they are not committed to the architecture and to the architect's work? If they are not even able to invest in, in, in solid tools for, your, for the architects, what does that say about that commitment? And your common office tools won't offer any of this. It's, it's obvious that you need true solid tools for that. Now, of course, being with BusyZine, I can uh, argue about our own tool being uh, certainly uh, a great choice for that. Just to give you the names of the, the, the product, Horizon is our platform, Enterprise Studio is the modeling tool in that. Uh, we support all these different kinds of disciplines, um, like several of our competitors do as well. It's the same kind of story for them. This is not limited to our tool. Of course, I think our tool is the best, but this would also work for them. Um, you want to link this to all kinds of external data sources. And central in this story is this multi-dimensional enterprise model that I was talking about, linking bits together so that you can make these analyses, create this line of sight from, from strategic goals to concrete initiatives, et cetera, et cetera. So this is what I want to leave you with. This is my final slide. And I think it's now time to open the floor for questions. Will. Thank you, Mark. What a great presentation. I was really struck by your slide there where you said you don't see sales using Microsoft Word to manage leads and you don't see, you know, I don't know, supply chain using stitched together Excel files to manage supply chain and inventory. Um, so I think your, your, your point's well made, but we've got a couple of questions I'm going to combine together, uh, which talks about when we're starting off, why wouldn't we start off with, an example was given here with uh, Visio, um, the Visio real-time collaboration mode. Um, and when we're starting off, then we establish uh, standard notations and structure and process, semantic rules, templates, and at some point migrate to a professional tool. And I'll combine that with the second question was, in your experience, is there, is there a tipping point where it becomes clear any kind of DIY solution is gonna fail or should you not even begin to start the path on a DOI solution? Yeah, I think, starting with the last one, uh, uh, if, you, if you build your own solutions based on, uh, on office tools, if you really put in that effort, I think you're, you're spending your effort in the wrong place as an architect, because you're not hired to build your own tools and, and put the effort in there. So I think that's, that's already a waste of effort. Uh, your, your organization won't like that. You are spending all that time to just put together some kind of homegrown tool suite based on well, office or whatever uh, you have. That's really not what you want to, to invest your time in. Your time should go to the actual business value that the, customer, the, the, the company needs. Um, but starting with, 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 the, with the, about the, the first question, starting with um, some, some simple set of tools just to see what your actual needs are, that could work, just to uncover what your needs are. But I wouldn't stick with them uh, for, for much longer because then you are starting to put all kinds of information in there that won't scale up and then you have to get it out again convert it again to a true tool so if you are just using it to uncover what your needs are in the short term just put some things together it might work for a short while but as soon as you start doing real work with it in any real life size organization it quickly scales up to something that won't work anymore with uh, with office tools and something simple you do need to have better support for that. Uh, and you also need to, to consider that it's, it's often broader than just specifically enterprise architecture. Uh, my, my story was a bit focused on that, but often it's, a, it's about other disciplines as well that, that's, that are interlinked with this whole world of designing your enterprise and, and guiding where it goes. Uh, well, basically the left-hand side of this slide, you see some other uh, areas as well. Um, so that's another reason that, that you often quickly need to scale up because you do need to have this interconnect with, with between these disciplines um, and just drawing some pictures in, in Visio, yeah that's just just such a small part of the overall work of an architect uh, you need much more than that so yes if you just want to uncover your needs I can imagine that you briefly do some work that way but you will quickly notice that it's not good enough that you need to scale up 
So we talked before, Mark, and I just really interested you could share your your commentary on this. That when when people get too deep into the Excel Visio PowerPoint world, they make up for shortcomings with people and onerous process to try and make this this machine work that's sort of very uh, fragile, uh, held together Excel spreadsheets and Visio diagrams. And I remember you making a comment once that when they when they start presenting incorrect information, then people lose faith in EA. Can you talk a little bit about how important it is that EA teams present an accurate view of the world and how um, an Excel Visio PowerPoint approach doesn't necessarily align with that, that goal? Yeah, that's really crucial. It's, it's about this decision making support. If you if you just show some vague pictures uh, or if you don't have the support for, um, uh, well, if you present something to, to, to senior management and, and they ask about how do you come to this conclusion? What is it based on? Uh, what are the facts behind this? And you, you just have to come up empty or, or show, show some pictures that don't really allow any true analysis. Uh, that's where often you lose, uh, you lose, well, you lose face. Uh, they lose faith um, because you, you can't really support your, your recommendations in any solid way. Uh, and increasingly, you see that organizations are data driven. They want to have the facts correct. Uh, and it's not good enough to just show some, some, some vague notions and pictures and PowerPoints. You really need to base yourself on the facts. Exactly. Um, there's one question here. Someone pointed out, you mentioned, you know, Excel is not a graph. Could you just expand that? Because I think there might have been some confusion. Excel can create graphs, but it's not a graph database and it's data structure. Uh, yeah. Excel can create charts. So pictures of data, but a graph database, graphs in the, the uh, mathematical sense of the word, uh, nodes and, uh, uh, and relationships between these nodes. That's the idea. So um, the structure of Excel is in tables and these tables can relate to each other, of course. But the structure of an architecture is not as regular as that. Uh, things are interconnected in various different ways at different levels, different layers. Um, and it's not a simple structure of tables of things that refer to other tables of things. Uh, that's the problem. And that's, that's where you need a different kind of structure to capture that information. And Excel doesn't really let you do that. Uh, it's, it's just not set up that way because it's, well, it's, it's a calculation tool for, for people in, uh, say, in the finance department. That's, that's where it comes from. And it's not intended to capture this, um, this richer, multi-dimensional world of all kinds of interconnections between all kinds of, uh, of elements. It's just a different, uh, different kind of data. Great. There's a great question coming in here. And um, again, based on your experience, so this, this person seems like they're deep in the world of Excel, Visio, PowerPoint. And their question is, how do we make the case to people who aren't enterprise architects the need to invest into a, a model-based tool? Do we appeal to, it will take us less people, or we can get you more uh, answers quicker, or we can answer more complex questions? Like, how do you make that case to, to well, invest I, in a tool? Okay, my whole presentation is about making that case. It's, it's about better support for decision-making. That's first and foremost. So analyses that support, um, say, where do you want to invest? Which projects to fund and which not? Or uh, well, I mentioned risk analyses or security or compliance or all kinds of things you can do with these models. That's certainly uh, one important part of such a case. But even the primitive level of uh, spending less effort on uh, stupid maintenance stuff you have to do manually when you're, you're using uh, PowerPoints versus having solid tools for that that keep things consistent automatically that let you collaborate without creating inconsistencies, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Just that is, is good enough, and even, even at a simple level, and maybe we should, uh, should uh, shoot a video of that, um, just the quality of modeling in a solid tool, and we did the comparison with Visio once, just the effort spent in creating a simple model, just by clicking it together uh, in our modeling environment is about half of what you spend in clicking it together in Visio. People know Visio and think, oh, it's Microsoft, I know that, must be simple. Actually, just the simple effort of putting things together in there uh, is already a lot higher than in a dedicated tool for creating architecture models. So even at that level, you can you can build a business case just to to look at how much work does the architect have in maintaining the architecture, in uh, working with colleagues, in maybe visualizing it differently for different stakeholders. All the work that you need to do manually using uh, using Office uh, tools versus 
uh, everything you get from a solid platform that's, that does much of that for you. Um, but I would say that's so secondary. The main value is in the fact that you will make better decisions in your organization because you have the facts at your fingertips. Uh, and if you don't have that, that's where the real costs are. Just making, making errors in, in those decisions, that's what's really costly. And of course, be more efficient as an architect, that's good. Save money, but being more effective is more important. I like that. And as you as you said to me before, Mark, you know, enterprise architecture is in, is informing enterprise strategy. It's been used to direct tens, if not hundreds of millions of dollars of IT investment. It's been used to re-engineer business processes that might significantly affect customer experience. All those things are so massively important in an enterprise. Why why would you do that with Excel Visio PowerPoint? Yeah. 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 Compliance as an issue. Uh, take for example um, personal data and uh, uh, regulations like uh, the GDPR from from Europe or um, say in, in healthcare in the US. Rules around it are really strict and really literally your your senior management could end up in jail if they're not uh, if they're not following the rules. Now try to to analyze that using Visio and PowerPoint. No way you can do that. But if you have solid models about where data is stored, where it's used, etc., how it flows through your landscape, you can you can support these analyses and, and ensure that you're you're compliant and not just do some hand waving and hope for the best. Yes, absolutely. Well, Mark, I'm going to thank you for your time today. I, just for everyone on the call, we will be sending out a recording of this presentation. Also available on that page will be a link to the PDF of this presentation, a great white paper that Mark wrote get laying out this case, and also a link to the latest 2019 Gartner Enterprise Architecture Magic Quadrant. Um, so thank you, Mark, for your time today, and thank you to everyone who joined for this call. And uh, I hope everyone has a great day. Thank you. Thank you all for attending.